Every weekend morning across the country, thousands of volunteers rise from their beds early to spend the day cleaning up and fixing up their towns. Business owners, local volunteers and townspeople make substantial efforts showing great pride in their communities. But in spite of their incredible efforts, most of our towns in recent years are in a constant state of decline. The closing of the bank and the post office is often followed by the closure of retail outlets, pubs and even grocery stores. The trend towards vacancy in our towns is relentless and has made many people genuinely worried about the future of their local towns. In an attempt to stem this tide, a new policy called Town Centre First sets out to reverse this decline. But will this be enough and what needs to be done to get Ireland's towns back on their feet? I'm on my way to the town of Dunleary in South County Dublin, where even here, one of Ireland's wealthiest districts, vacancy and dereliction have been creeping in over the years. But in the last year, they've been making great efforts here to turn it all around. Tara Buckley is Director General of the Retail Trade Association representing 4,000 family-owned shops across the country. Tara was one of the first people to blow the whistle on the decline of Ireland's towns. There's been a number of challenges to the traditional town centre. Um, I suppose, first of all, it was the arrival of the out-of-town and edge-of-town multiple, the big multiples coming and not building in the town centre. And what did those big multiples do? How did they damage the town centre? Well, what they do is they become a counter-attraction to the town centre. So instead of and going from shop to shop, they go out to a big car park, a big box on a greenfield site outside the town, and they do a one-stop shop and they go home and they never visit the town centre. Then also people moved out of our towns, so people stopped living in the towns. It wasn't fashionable to live in the towns. And then the towns began to look, you know, they, they, they started not to look so well, and then people weren't attracted to come into them. Some towns, my memory is the last, the last business standing. This is all about our sense of community, our sense of belonging, um, our sense of place and person. If people don't like the look or feel of your town, or they don't think it's a place to sit or a place to congregate, they won't come. It's about that experience you have when you arrive into the town. And if you make that an attractive experience. So public realm is about the look of the buildings, the look of the streets, it's about the planting, the lighting, it's about the seating spaces outside, it's about the, the open square, it's about places for children that feel safe, it's about places for people who are maybe in wheelchairs, it's making the, the pathway safe, it's making people feel comfortable to come in with their families, to come in, you know, as a couple or whatever, and spend time. So that's why public realm is so important to, to everyone who lives in the town. Here in Dunleary, tremendous work has been done recently to improve the public realm temporarily pedestrianising the main street so far seems to be bringing more footfall and vibrancy. Ireland's new climate action plan and the new town centre first policy sets out to breed new life back into town centres by encouraging the return of family living back to towns up and down the country. A new urban regeneration development fund is now in place to support these initiatives. The biggest beneficiary so far is Sligo Town, who were recently awarded 47 million euro from this fund. So to find out more about the challenges Sligo faces to rejuvenate its town centre, I've recruited my two-year-old granddaughter 
Sophia. I'm just waiting for this traffic to clear. Where I go? So I can get a sense of a family experience in Sligo Town Centre. My first impression of Sligo Town is that it's filled with stunning heritage buildings, but that almost every street is congested with traffic. It's one thing for me to navigate all this traffic, but trying to enjoy a shopping experience with a toddler who has her own ideas can be a little stressful. It's great to see that in spite of all the difficulties, Sligo Town still has a thriving community of independent shops, keeping the town centre alive. So now, properly attired, we're ready for an outdoor lunch. As a grandparent, I cherish time spent with my grandchildren. Do you like Sligo? Yeah. Is this a nice town? But as all grandparents know, one of the best parts of being a grandparent is that whenever it becomes too much, you can always hand them back. To get a better sense of how Sligo is changing, I'm meeting Finn Barfylan, a local shop owner who is heavily involved in the tidy towns and business improvement district. So are you from the town yourself? Literally over the street, Duncan, 100 metres away is where I was born and reared. Above the shop, is it? Above the shop. We lived above the shop. My mother, my father and my, my siblings, seven of us in total. And that's where we lived and the streets were our playground. And not only just us, but there was 10 families living on these streets. But over time, as all the children moved away and as the parents retired, we lost that family environment in our town centres and, and the families are gone out of our, our, our urban cores. Roughly how many people are living in the centre of Sligo? 20,000 people living in, in this urban area of Sligo, but if you look at O'Connell Street, there's only one resident on O'Connell Street, which is our main street. So what is the reason that families have moved out of, out of our towns? People wanted to have the playground, the space, the back garden, and they wanted to have their house in, out of, just out of the town centre. And there was a drive towards that in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s to pull people out of the town centres. Retail has changed. If you go back 20 years, people came to town to shop and might have a cup of coffee. Now people come to town to have a cup of coffee and they might shop. So it's all about making the town centre a place you want to be in. And it's the place management and the linger and the experience. Finbar's story highlights the ongoing changes our towns have been experiencing for quite a long time now, and reveals how the growing levels of vacancy have become so normalised that most of us have stopped seeing it. But this is not unique to Sligo, it's commonplace across the whole country. Surprisingly, the solutions may come from unusual sources. A new programme called the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check is a boots-on-the-ground initiative run by Alison Harvey of the Heritage Council, which was set up to support the regeneration of historic town centres. From a Heritage Council perspective, you know, how important is our town centres? Town centres are where our natural, our cultural, our built heritage all come together. And that's what makes our towns unique. It is about the sort of character in the area, it's about the materials that have been used, you know, it's about how things were designed. And I think people were really sort of starting to see that that was kind of, you know, the fabric was on fraying a little bit. Absolutely. So what have the Heritage Council done now about this? What we do is we look at, you know, we would do footfall surveys, we would do full land use surveys. We also do consumer surveys to see how, how do people, you know, how is consumer behaviour in that town centre, how much are people shopping online. We also do commercial surveys, so again, we're fundamentally talking to the business people right. who have been in these town centres for right. generations, right. and I think that that's really important. Now, how is Sligo performing? Sligo is actually sort of in the middle of the table, as we would call it, you know, it's a wee bit like a football league. So, um, you know, Sligo, in terms of the vacancy that we found when we did the surveys, around 18%. That, that's only ground floor retail, okay, so like the upper floors are obviously much higher, you know, 80% plus. 
the vacancy rates are not the norm. So the normal vacancy level would be 5% to 11%. For are you saying across Europe? Yes, across Europe, yes. 5 to 11% is would normal. Would be the normal range. Right. The figures are way, way higher than the European average. Yeah, they are very much higher. And some of our town centres, their vacancy levels are at 24%. Really? They're at 31%. Yeah, they're at, they're at levels that I have never seen, you know. So once you go above 11%, alarm bells are meant to go off. But unfortunately in Ireland, the alarm bells didn't go off because we weren't monitoring and we weren't tracking the vacancy rates in our town centres, which is why I think we've got to this point where everybody is sort of going, right, stop. And is living in our towns important? Oh. More people living in the town centres? I think that's hugely important. I mean, that, that's one of the key issues that we're finding. Because if retail is obviously going through a transformation and people don't live in town centres as much as they used to, we need to really think about how do we use our town centres? You know, what are the various uses that are needed? That mix, that critical mass that makes it work. Yeah, and so is there systemic failure here? I think the, the issue is that our systems are not agile enough to deal with the problem. So because we've got the vacancy levels now, they're so high that we're going to have to introduce new tools. So other countries in Europe are introducing compulsory sale orders, okay, where if you sit on a vacant building for more than two years, then you have to sell it. And it is a problem, fundamentally, because the vacancy levels are so high. So for us to bring them back down, I think we're going to have to be more agile, we're going to have to be more collaborative, and we're going to have to work in partnership. Alison's Collaborative Town Centre Health Check programme is highlighting some of the alarming facts about our towns. But what can we do now to turn this trend around? Sligo Town is steeped in a rich collage of built heritage, culture and history going back over a thousand years. The Garifold River connecting Loch Gill to the ocean is what attracted the earliest settlers here. And on a nice day like this, it's great to see that this aspect of Sligo's heritage has been reinvented as a fabulous amenity. It's here I'm meeting Gail McGibbon, who is CEO of Sligo's Business Improvement District. So what did the business sector want as outcomes from the public realm schemes? There's a very strong sense that um, again it's been accelerated by Covid um, that change was coming. I mean our urban centres are changing. Um, if you look at uh, the changes within retail on its own, we didn't have driven that. Driven by what by the way? Driven by online changes, online behaviour. Um, I think there's a stat out there at the moment that in 2019 the Irish spent seven billion online and, and we are pushing the message of go local first. So how does public realm come into this? So making it more attractive, enjoyable, usable, um, livable is hugely important to the vibrancy and sustainability going into the, into the next decade and into the next two decades. If you look at the high street and the main street, when you go to visit a place, you don't go to what you have at home. You're actually going to what looks different. So that dwell time and that bums on seats and feet on the street, we have to offer a variety of experiences. Otherwise, experience. Experience. I like that all word. about the experience. Yeah. So I'm coming to a place. I want to eat, shop, drink, socialize and be entertained. And what about children, families? Has to be family friendly. What that needs to be done for that? Uh, family friendly is all about uh, what you offer in the centre of town. Sligo, like most towns in Ireland, is completely dominated by the car. While pedestrians are squeezed onto narrow footpaths, which makes accessing the public realm far less enjoyable, for me anyway. But there are seeds of change happening here in Sligo with a new cycling campaign, trying to make this town more livable and accessible. Have you got good facilities here in town for cycling? It's all cars, cars of clarity, right of way. And people, you feel people don't want you to be on a bicycle. You actually feel you're being, you can hear them revving, trying to get by you. you. They see you as a nuisance on the bike. Yeah. I know the town of Sligo and really wants to make it a livable town and they want to encourage people to walk and cycle. Do you think that could be achieved? The major issue for us is the lack of joined up networks. There's pieces of cycle infrastructure here and there, uh, but it's not really coherent and not joined up in a way that allows you to make a journey or get to a destination 
with uh, within a protected cycleway. The main obstacle is the mindset which assumes that uh, cars are what mean progress and that business can't be conducted uh, unless people are able to drive and uh, you know park outside uh, the shop. There needs to be traffic calming, slow the whole thing down so that more cyclists can feel safe. We found it very dangerous. Uh, but I think there's huge potential that the council, I suppose, need to really listen to what people that are cycling, some of the suggestions that we're going to make. Cycling has so many benefits in terms of health benefits and you don't have emissions and if you have more bicycles you have less noise, you have less air pollution and so on. The prevalence of vacant buildings and underutilised backlands in Sligo town and a new wave of working from home initiatives opens up an emerging opportunity for a skilled workforce to migrate back to towns like Sligo. But despite the high level of vacancy, there's a real shortage of homes up for sale in the town centre, where so many buildings have already fallen into dereliction. To find out why, I've come to meet Ronan Gilroy, whose family owns a large bank of derelict property in the backlands of Sligo Town Centre. So this was a grain store. He's agreed to meet me to explain why this site has not yet been developed. It was used obviously yeah, for storing grain. Right now it's, it's just a ruin. It was my father and a businessman here um, with, the, with the funds of their business, they were able to gain capital to invest. This is huge potential here, there's no doubt. We would have entered here. Yeah, and, uh, so we came up so through this, potentially this mall. This here. is a footprint and yeah. it extends right to the Savoy Cinema. Okay. And that was the development, the intended development. That cost 1.3 million just to bring that to planning. So that was acquiring the likes of this shed just to square up, to square up the site. So you had to acquire more land in that 1.3 million. And yeah. then you have fees, you have engineers, architects, so why is it not developed now? I mean, if you, this is going back how long, all of this? It's not built now because it was 2007 until permission was finally granted. OK, so it went to a long... It went a long period of time. Right. OK, fine, yeah, yeah. And basically, there was no, vit no vitality at that time. Yeah, but now couldn't it be built? Can this particular... Yeah. Well, obviously, regulations have changed over time. So that, that money is dead now. That, that, that planning application is dead. They, they expire 10 years. Uh, so, you know, who, who in the right mind is going to go through that process again? And why don't you just sell it? Sell the site? Why, why not? It, it has been put on the market. It it has, you had it on the market, yeah? It has been, it has and, been and put on the market. And nobody showed any interest? There's no interest. And There's why? no interest in any site like Why, Ronan? Like why is that? Because, maybe it's because it's a tricky site. Maybe yeah. it's because it has... Maybe it's because it has a building like this. Any developer knows that that's an extra cost. That mm -hmm. structure has to be obviously mm -hmm. uh, from the a protection order on this building. Fine. That's, that is that's, the issue, is it? That is that's a, a heavy investment. When some say landowners are unwilling to develop, or property owners are unwilling to develop, that's not true because we did, we tried, we got resistance, not assistance. Is this viable for a developer to build? Yes or no? In a town like. Sligo. Is it financially viable for it? With the right supports and with the right infrastructure, I believe it is. Commercial viability, it has to make sense mm -hmm. to any investor. Mm -hmm. There's an awful amount of risk involved in yeah, doing something sure. like this, as we have learned. Yeah. It's an eyesore. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I'm, proud of my, I'm proud of my town. I, I, want my, yeah. I want to see my town develop. I want sure. to see it progress. It's probably happening in every town in Ireland that you have these type of problems. So we need to come up with solutions. Instead of building out in the greenfield sites on the periphery of our towns, or even further out, which is totally unsustainable, mm -hmm. we need to build in the towns like this. What we need is, we need a town regeneration agency. Okay, sounds a good That's idea. Yeah. Heritage is the unique asset that our towns have to offer. That it seems acceptable to allow our heritage buildings to fall into ruin. Yet, red tape only kicks in when owners try to bring heritage buildings back into use. Seems like a flaw in the system to me. Currently, local authorities are the only ones building in our town centres. 
while private housing is almost all out of town. This creates a wealth divide between those left living in local authority housing in towns and the merchant class living in the suburbs. Surely we need a more balanced mix. It's clear that some stimulus is needed to kickstart private housing back into town centres. Perhaps a focus on the livability of the urban realm should be where that needs to begin. I wonder if the problem is that not enough of our elected representatives live in towns these days. So towns rarely have a champion or vision maker that will drive through the necessary big changes. If we had vision makers in charge, then what could towns like Sligo look like? Two local architects from Sligo IT took me to reveal some of the hidden gems of Sligo Town. You'll have been amazed Where? actually if we come down here and if you can sort of oh, jump, you mean up, go up here? jump up on this. Yeah, just get up on this. You can jump up. Okay. I don't know if we'll all do it. Oh, wow. And Absolutely. You, like, like literally the abbey is just there. And when, if you, beyond those buildings is the cloistered, is the beautiful cloistered courtyard. Oh. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. There's no connection to that, to the abbey, for the community or for the public through this river walk. Just crying out to be done. So yeah. what a great thing to see. That would make, a, transform this. This could become a wonderful public realm space. Is there potential on the North Bank to do more? So there's a series of historic um, coach arch pathways that connect the mall, which runs parallel to the river, to the river, and that would have been used. So there are their little yes, laneways yes, coming down. Yes. Aren't they in the public access for the public? The potential the is there to bring the mall closer to right. um, to the town, to more make the porous, town sort of more yeah. porous. Yeah, I mean, it connects to all the big yeah, cultural buildings, have, the library, yeah. the model yeah. arts right. centre. Yeah. Without cars, being able to just walk through. And you could, you could have little areas along the river yeah. for people to sit and Absolutely. enjoy the river. Yeah. But what we're finding though is there's an awful lot of people that feel they need to get into the town in their car. They're living out in the country yeah. or distant from yeah. the centre and they feel they need to. And the shopkeeper's the same. How do we deal with that problem? Because it seems to be endemic all over Ireland, it's not just here. Yeah. I think it's about having key spaces where cars can be parked or nodes around the town to disperse the, to, to disperse the, the car parking but not that far away. Like literally you could still only be a five minute walk away from the shop you wanted to go to, but you're still parked in a place that actually, you create a route that allows people to be able to. Yeah, I think it's it, to be able to open the, the visual links. So like that idea of being able to see the Abbey from down here, towns like this were designed for people rather than, rather than cars and that. So with a small bit of creative vision, I think that um, we can do a lot. If we could go down with a wrecking ball and a digger, we could actually sort out a lot of this very quickly. You know, if we had a few people, we could literally just remove a few buildings, create a, <laughs> create a sort of pathways, unlock it ourselves. Because there's simple things to, it's actually quite a straightforward And then everybody would appreciate potential. them immediately. Yeah. Bernadette and Cleona are fantastic ambassadors for the architectural profession and visionaries for Sligo. Our towns only have a chance if we start listening to people like these. With the help of new urban regeneration funding, Sligo already has some exciting public realm improvements about to start. But brave and innovative plans that will create fundamental changes to make the urban core much more livable are still lacking for most of our towns. If we want to see real change in our towns, then we all need to become vision makers and to positively and collectively engage in revitalizing our towns. It's the only way they can survive and thrive.